My name is Stephen Cook, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Carleton University's Science Cafe, yet another edition. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, and today that is Dr. Sean Landsman. Sean is an instructor in our Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science. He's one of our newest hires at Carleton, and uh, we're, we're thrilled that he's able to showcase his work with you today. Sean did his undergrad studies at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and while he was there, he did some internships with the Illinois Natural History Survey. It happens to be where I did my PhD, and at, at some point along the way, we crossed paths. Um, my PhD uh, supervisor um, uh, helped connect us. That's who Sean was working with down there as well. And then Sean, uh, Sean ended up doing his Master's of Science in Biology at Carleton, uh, working with me. Sean is a fanatical muskellunge angler. Uh, if you don't know what a muskie is, you can think of them sort of as a freshwater barracuda. They're about four feet long, rather toothy critters. And they're also called the fish of 10,000 casts. So they aren't the kind of fish you're just going to go out on the weekend and, you know, dabble and, and catch. These are fish that are really the challenge to catch. And Sean did his masters on those animals. So that meant he had to spend an absolute ton of time in the water. That meant that he needed to recruit volunteer anglers. And so he worked quite closely with uh, Muskies Canada and, and other volunteers to do uh, really a quite fine and, and unique piece of science on understanding uh, how uh, the spatial ecology of muskellunge and how they do in response to different fisheries interactions. After that, Sean went back to Illinois where he worked with uh, the state government for uh, a period of time before starting a PhD at the University of Prince Edward Island. There he worked uh, again in the, the biological realm studying fish passage, so trying to understand um, you know, what we can do to help fish get past barriers. Uh, when Sean finished, he, uh, he continued to uh, stay at UPEI, where he worked as uh, an instructor, uh, teaching a, a number of different courses before we were able to entice him to join us here at Carleton. I'll add that Sean is also an accomplished photographer. That photo that you see behind him uh, is one that I'm going to guess he took. Uh, so uh, not just a photographer, but an underwater photographer. And Sean is well known for his expertise in science communication. In fact, he's president of the science communication section of the American Fisheries Society. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean. He's gonna tell us a fishy tale. And when he's done, we'll be thrilled to uh, take any questions that you have. Along the way, you can enter them into the question box. Uh, we're not gonna touch them until, it's all, until things are, are wrapped up, until Sean's done with the formal presentation. But when a question comes to you, you're welcome to, uh, to fire it uh, into that Q&A box and we'll, we'll tackle them when it's all said and done. So with that, Sean. Great, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Let me uh, share my screen. And, okay, can everyone see that? Hopefully we go over here. Okay, now it should be full screen there. Um, yes, thank, thank you, Steve, uh, very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, as, as Steve said, I, I am a very, I, I don't want to say obsessed, um, but passionate about uh, muskies or muskellunge. Uh, I spend a lot of time um, pursuing them uh, recreationally. I think they're an incredible species. We could have an entire Science Cafe event all about uh, muskies, but today I want to... Um, talk about a topic that I uh, kind of stumbled into as I was trying to think about what topics I might pursue as part of my PhD research. So as Steve mentioned, um, I, I completed a PhD at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, now, yes, as an island, it is surrounded by saltwater, uh, but actually, PEI has a tremendous number of small streams um, and uh, there's a number of different migratory species that come into those systems. Uh, there's lots of little ponds, little impoundments uh, sprinkled all over the island and uh, associated with those impoundments 
are a number of dams, right? It's how you create an impoundment, you dam up a river uh, and that uh, slows down the water flow behind the, uh, behind the dam and it floods a big area uh, and there you've created your pond or your little lake. Um, so there's a lot of those on PEI. And so as I was exploring what to do relative to fish passage and fish movement and what projects I wanted to study, you know, I was already familiar with this whole salmon feed forests thing, which we will talk about in a little while. But some of you may already be familiar with that on the West Coast, the case of Pacific salmon. And you know, I want to get too ahead of myself. Um, but I thought, you know, there's probably the same thing and just in different species kind of happening uh, on the East Coast. And there had been some work done up to that point, um, but I, I definitely wanted to pursue that as, as part of my uh, uh, as part of my PhD was to explore the interconnectedness between freshwater ecosystems and the migratory fish that then visit them uh, during uh, during different times of the year. So the photo that you see here, um, those little fish in the bottom part uh, of the photo, uh, those are rainbow smelt. We'll talk, we'll spend some time talking about them today. Um, we do have those, some of you may be going, oh, I've heard of rainbow smelt before. Uh, and indeed, we do have rainbow smelt in the Great Lakes. Um, they're an invader, they're an invasive species in the Great Lakes. But on the east coast of North America, uh, that's part of their, their native range. And so they're a really important species on the, on the east coast uh, for a variety of reasons. So we'll, we'll explore some of that today. All right, so the other thing I wanted to do and, and when I was trying to think of a topic to talk about today, I knew that today would be, or that this presentation would fall somewhere around the, uh, the uh, US election. So I know that things are maybe a little tense right now and it's my hope that I can actually get you, get you all to transport yourselves into this beautiful underwater world where there's, there's incredible connections going on between fish and insects and, uh, and fur bearers and trees. Um, so I, it's my hope today that this presentation will kind of maybe lift up your spirits a little bit uh, and take you on a nice visual journey. So to try and get you there, um, what I'd like to do, I'm going to play a video in just a second, but I kind of want you to relax and transport yourselves to the land of Anne of Green Gables. I'd like you to transport yourselves to the shores of Prince Edward Island, okay, sometime in April. It's a little bit chilly. There's even a little snow on the ground. Uh, there's a crisp bite in the air, but you can feel, you can feel that winter is in the past. And we're coming into a new season, okay. So envision that. Now also envision chaos. Chaos in the sky with birds, crows, gulls, herons, eagles all flying around. Uh, they're going up and down the river. Um, there's, you know, a kind of a pungent smell in the air from, uh, un unfortunately, some dead fish bodies that are scattered around the, uh, around the bank. Um, but this is, this is all part of nature's and natural uh, this is a, a natural phenomenon, this phenomenon of, of migration that uh, these fish that are moving in to their spawning grounds. And in this case, what I'm going to show you in just a second on this video, uh, these are rainbow smelts. So let's just, uh, I want to get you primed for this presentation by showing you a, a beautiful little video. Hopefully the, the, the quality is okay and you can hear some, um, some audio. <laughs>
So that was uh, just several little video clips all thrown together of the rainbow smelt migration on, on Prince Edward Island. So you could see eagles soaring in the sky and gulls dipping down, uh, huge numbers of fish, uh, thousands of fish in some of those schools. Uh, all congregating in one in one small area. I don't know if you caught, uh, there were eggs uh, covering the bottom of some of those really shallow areas of the streams and some of those were little side channels. So you saw a number of rainbow smelt that were, uh, had been caught as the water level started to recede um, as, as the migration continued uh, on. Uh, some of those individuals got stuck there and ended up becoming uh, prey and food for um, uh, for raccoons, okay? So this is all kind of a natural, uh, a natural process. Um, this often happens when we're dealing with the, this particular type of migration strategy, which I'll go into in just a, a minute. But this, whoops, but this presentation is largely based around migratory fishes uh, providing ecosystem services. And we could we could spend a long time talking about a number of different ecosystem services that that fish provide and there's a whole range of them i'm going to focus today on on one kind called a linking service which i'll get to in just a moment if you're not familiar with the term ecosystem service it's effectively any environmental function feature or resource that supports human well-being i'd like to sort of uh, draw your attention to the to the term there, well-being. It's not necessarily about survival. It it can it can um, contribute to that, say through food, um, but well-being, including like mental health. So we have the aesthetics. So you know, waterways and waterfalls and mountains and uh, some of these um, uh, less demand derived, as we see there. So you can take ecosystem services and kind of broadly break them down into say two, two subcategories. So demand derived, so uh, what humans have placed an importance on, um, and then these kind of fundamental ecosystem services. Uh, so, so things that are fundamental to the proper functioning uh, of ecosystems that then support uh, humans. So some really common examples um, of ecosystem services would be barrier dunes. So again, I lived on Prince Edward Island and there's lots of dunes uh, ringing, the, ringing the island and, and those were, you know, really needed for storm protection, right? For protecting against storm surges and high wind events. Uh, trees produce oxygen. They produce uh, the construction lumber that we use to build our homes, build our shelters. Um, marshes, so the, they act as natural filters, so filtering out contaminants, uh, sediment from running into, into our rivers. Um, this picture on the right, that's actually, uh, uh, was taken at the Experimental Lakes area in Northwest Ontario, and there's a group of researchers that are looking at uh, harnessing the power of certain types of, uh, of wetland plants um, to, uh, to basically break down and, and absorb oil that might be spilled, say, from a, uh, a tanker on a, on a train, overturning and spilling, uh, and spilling oil into a, a freshwater, uh, you know, a lake or a river. Um, and so some of the, uh, the fuzzy bits on the, on the bottom of, the, um, uh, of those roots there, there's um, a bacterial community that can help break down uh, the oil. So that was a, a picture from a study that was looking at that. Bees and crop pollination, sharks and ecotourism. If anyone's ever uh, dove the sharks, um, there's, a, there's a perfect example of sharks kind of acting as a bit of an ecosystem service. Okay, so fun facts about fish migration that you can all impress your friends with. Um, well, there's only about 800 species. Uh, it sort of depends on what, uh, what number of fish species, total number of fish species you use. It could be 28,000, some people say, upwards of 32,000. So all told, it's about 2.5% uh, of, of fishes we know of um, actually migrate. There would be a number of reasons fish uh, would migrate. They would, they'll often migrate for spawning purposes, but also for uh, finding food. So we see, um, we see food-based migrations and things like bluefin tuna. Um, so again, I lived on uh, PEI. We had bluefin tuna that visited our waters every year, but they didn't spawn there. Um, they typically, the western stock, tend to spawn in the Gulf of Mexico, and then they'll migrate, eventually migrate up into the uh, uh, into New England and then the Canadian Maritimes to feed during the summer. Then they'll go back 
uh, to, to spawn later. Uh, and there might be other reasons as well. It could be escaping predators or it could be escaping um, deteriorating environmental conditions. So on the bottom right, uh, that's a sea run brook trout um, that was captured in Prince Edward Island in the middle, middle of the summer. Now, if you know anything about brook trout, they are a fall spawner. So the picture behind me, my background here, these are spawning brook trout uh, in the fall. In fact, you can actually see there's a bit of their nest on the bottom there below this big one. And, uh, but they do come into the rivers in the summer and that's thought to be for a couple of reasons. One may be to ripen their gonads. Uh, and another reason uh, might be because they're escaping sort of deteriorating environmental conditions in the estuaries um, around Prince Edward Island that can actually go completely anoxic, which means um, zero oxygen. So there's too many nutrients coming off of the land on Prince Edward Island, making their way into the estuaries, create al algae blooms, those algae end up dying, those plants die, and they suck all the oxygen out of the water. And so as water gets warmer, the oxygen de de declines. And so there's a whole, whole host of things that are going on there. And it's thought that brook trout will actually come back into the rivers uh, to escape some of those things in the summer. Um, there's several types of, um, uh, of, of fish migration. So we have freshwater only migrators. We have those that are only migrating in the ocean. So again, things like sharks uh, and tuna. Um, and then we have some that will actually move uh, between habitats at different uh, times of their lives. And so I've highlighted uh, the word both and anadromous because that's the, the anadromous type um, is, is, is what we're going to focus on today. And so anadromy is characterized by the following, birth in freshwater, an ocean growth period. So eventually those little juveniles will out migrate into the ocean, grow nice and big, and then they'll come back into uh, freshwater where, where they'll breed again, where they'll spawn. Uh, and catadromy is, is, is like that, but it's just the reverse. And that, speed, that category, that class of my, migration uh, is, is uh, typified by American eels. So you see that on the top right there. So American eels will, uh, will give birth in the, um, uh, they'll spawn in the ocean. And then those juveniles will eventually drift into, at least American eels, will drift into kind of North America, coastal North America. And then they'll come into freshwater where they'll grow for a number of years, could be 10, 20, 30 years even, um, before they'll out-migrate back to the ocean, okay? So we're gonna focus today on anadromous species though. Um, and the anadromous species are, are important, or the reason we're going to focus on them today is because when they are out in the ocean and they're consuming all sorts of nutrients and food resources in the ocean, they're incorporating those marine derived nutrients into their bodies and into the, in the case of uh, females, uh, into their eggs, okay? And so what happens is when they actually come back into the freshwater systems, they're bringing with them all of those marine derived nutrients and they're bringing them into these freshwater systems, which in temperate latitudes tend to not be as productive as the oceans. So that's, that's a reason, that's the reason why uh, you see these fish often go to sea instead of staying in freshwater to eat, they'll go out to sea uh, where there's more food resources available to them. Um, when they come back in, they'll deliver those, those marine derived nutrients in, um, in a few different forms. So in their excretory products, uh, in their eggs, and in their carcasses. So the bottom left photo here, I don't know what it looks like on your screen there. Um, my screen, my, my external monitor is a little bit bigger. I can actually see little oil globules within the, uh, within the eggs themselves, okay? So there's chock full of really, you know, lots of omega-3s, omega-6s, um, lots of fatty acids and lipids. These are a really important food source. We'll get to that in a bit. And you can see some more photos here. Here's an uh, alewife carcass that has been uh, colonized by a bunch of snails. Uh, and here's a raccoon that's prowling the shoreline uh, looking for a uh, rainbow smelt. You can see that they don't often consume the entire fish. They'll often consume just the head or just the tail. Um, so they're kind of picky in terms of what they, uh, what they eat. Okay, so the next several slides, I'm going to kind of give you a rundown of the different anadromous species, mostly here in, in North America. Um, and we'll, 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 take, we'll take a look at some case studies uh, from the West Coast, from the East Coast, 
We'll actually look at some species uh, in, the, uh, in the Great Lakes. So I'll get to that in just a second because that's not, that's not technically a nadrum because they're not technically going into the ocean. We'll get to that in a little bit, okay? So here's, uh, here's just a quick video here. Uh, these are uh, pink salmon. So one of the things we need to understand about the West Coast story is that the Pacific salmon on the West Coast, they die after they spawn. So you can already see there's a big gaping hole. He's got, uh, this female has some fungus on her eye. Uh, you can see the, the fins are starting to rot, that big gaping hole on the side of that fish. Their bodies are starting to break down. They've invested all this energy to get to the spawning grounds. They've also invested a ton of energy into producing high quality gametes, eggs and, and sperm. Um, and so at some point they'll finish the spawning process and then they'll, they'll die. Okay. That's typically uh, what, what, what happens on the, on the West Coast. Um, here we go. A lot of the systems on the West Coast are kind of primed and ready to receive this pulse of nutrients from uh, anadromous species. So uh, many of the watersheds out that way are, are quite nutrient deprived, what we would call oligotrophic. Um, and so, you know, this it's strong pulse of, of nutrients that are coming in in the, uh, in the summer and, and the fall primarily um, are really welcomed by a number of organisms living within these ecosystems. So we know from, from research uh, done by a number of different uh, scientists that salmon feed forests. Um, they, uh, so there was a recent study, it was published, I think it was in 2018, uh, yeah, it's the Quinn et al. study in 2018, uh, where they took 20 years of data from a project where they were actually uh, adding salmon carcasses on one side of a river and then removing some salmon carcasses from another side uh, to try and see if there were any differences in growth rates and incorporation of marine-derived nutrients. Uh, in the forest on one side of the river and the forest on the other. And they found that the trees grew a lot faster over that 20 year period um, in the, on the side of the river where they were adding a bunch of, uh, of salmon carcasses. So this is a well-documented uh, relationship there. Um, they're a critical food source for bears, coastal wolves, uh, mink, otters, a whole host of things. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, iconic images of a grizzly bear standing on top of a waterfall with a salmon uh, jumping into his mouth and his mouth is, is wide open, ready to catch it. Um, Pacific salmon provide a boost of nutrients to bugs. Uh, those bugs then feed stream resident fishes and birds as well. So things like American Dipper uh, and some other, uh, other ground foraging passerines like, uh, like winter wrens, for example. Um, they also improve the growth in stream resident fishes. So again, the stream resident fish will actually uh, consume the, the bugs. There will be more, more aquatic insects around. The aquatic insects tend to be a little bigger. Um, some of the fish will actually feed on the eggs that are, you know, drifting downstream. Um, lots, of, lots of lipids and fatty acids in those. Um, they'll feed on little bits of the carcasses. So. Um, Pretty much everything uses uh, Pacific salmon uh, on, on the West Coast and the nutrients provided by them. But even wine, okay, so some of you may be chuckling right now, that is my grandmother if you're wondering who is that beautiful woman. That is my grandmother and she loves wine and that's uh, one of my favorite pictures of her. But yes, there was actually uh, two researchers that um, looked at the incorporation of Chinook salmon, so this type of Pacific salmon, Chinook salmon nutrients into uh, vineyards. Uh, in the uh, Mokalumni uh, River just outside of San Francisco and found, they found those nutrients incorporated into the grapes uh, that were growing uh, in, the, uh, in that vineyard. So uh, even your wine is not, uh, cannot escape the influence of, uh, uh, of marine derived nutrients. On the East Coast, um, near and dear to my heart, so I lived there for six years, um, the East Coast situation is a little bit different. So on the East Coast, remember on the West Coast, most of the, so Pacific salmon are, tend to be characterized by the semel Paris life history strategy, meaning they die after they spawn. Well, on the East Coast, that's not, that's not really the case. Most of the fish on the East Coast, most of these anadromous migrating species on the East Coast are actually repeat spawners. So they come in and they spawn, and then they're able to turn around and go back out to sea. Yes, you, you do get fish that die. You saw you know, in the video footage there with the, with the rainbow smell, lots of fish die. Um, but a lot of them will turn around and come right back out to sea, go out, 
uh, consume more nutrients and then come back in the next year. Um, so Atlantic salmon are, are like that. Um, as are river herring. So river herring is a term used to kind of um, reference uh, both alewives and blueback herring, kind of lump them all together. They look almost identical. Um, so there's a, some alewife slash river herring. It's on top right corner there. Um, and what the relatively limited amount of research, I say that relatively because on the West Coast, there's tons of studies that have demonstrated these connections with the ecosystems out there. Um, but in, on the East Coast, there's not been as much work done there. But what has been done uh, shows that uh, algae, uh, the, the biofilms, if you ever walk through a river and it's kind of slippery, that's usually going to be biofilm, which is a collection of autotrophic and heterotrophic little microscopic organisms that are coating the rocks. Um, and so algae and these other primary producers are incorporating those nutrients. You get a boost in productivity um, within, these, within these streams that are receiving uh, anadromous fish. Uh, the insects too will grow bigger. Um, they'll incorporate those nutrients uh, either indirectly or directly by, by uh, actually uh, colonizing some of the dead carcasses or some of the eggs that are laid in the, in the rivers. Um, and then they also provide food for resident fishes. Um, so things like, uh, like brook trout, little small juvenile brook trout in Prince Edward Island, uh, when the rainbow smelt come into the rivers, that is like their eggs from the rainbow smelt are their number one food source for a relatively short period of time, but their bellies will be chocked full. They're just like bursting at the seams um, just from consuming so many of these little, uh, little rainbow smelt eggs. They also provide food for uh, fur bears. You saw that, that photo earlier uh, of the raccoon that was foraging for them. And apparently, uh, oops, I, uh, <laughs> I jumped the gun there. I'll get, to the, I'll get to the punchline in just a second. But I, I did want to include uh, this, uh, this little depiction here. This is a graph. I thought I'd throw a little bit of data into this presentation. Um, but before I get to my punchline, um, I wanted to show you here what this kind of looks like when we're actually trying to track these nutrients into the river systems and in, then into the, into the food webs. So we're actually able to kind of follow um, some of the chemical signatures that are, uh, are, are shown in the, the anadromous fishes. We can follow that signature into the food web. And so this is what we're seeing here. This is in brook trout, these red, um, uh, the red symbols. So this is an area that's receiving rainbow smelt and so you can see that the, the signatures start to go up as those rainbow smelt move into uh, the river system. So the migration period is, is, the, is the gray box there, this whole duration. So they're being incorporated into the organism, into the brook trout. And then we had this other reference section of the same river far farther upstream. And they don't, that section doesn't receive rainbow smelt. And you can see we, we don't see the same pattern occurring uh, in that uh, in that section, okay, it remains relatively uh, relatively constant throughout the year. Um, so yeah, I wanted to show you kind of just how we do that, and, and that this is really this is actually really happening. Um, so now to get to my punchline, so they provide food for resident fishes, fur bearers, and apparently barn cats too. So I had set a, a, a camera trap up along the side of the river and uh, was photographing raccoons and trying to find like, I actually was really wanted a photo of a mink uh, hunting along the shoreline. Um, and so I would go down every few days and check this camera, uh, which is a big DSLR with, uh, with external flashes uh, and a motion sensor. And I looked on the back of the camera one day and to my surprise, there was this cheeky little, uh, this cheeky little cat here that was licking his chops uh, after eating the uh, pile of dead smelt right there. I showed this photo to the, uh, to the landowner and he chuckled. He said, oh, that's our barn cat. I haven't seen that cat in weeks. I thought, I thought we had lost him. I thought he was a goner, but it's good to see that he's actually still around. So um, yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty funny. So the other species that actually does resemble um, the life, same life history strategy uh, that we see in the in Pacific salmon um, is the sea lamprey, and uh, so he, sea lamprey are really interesting. So they'll come they'll come in in the spring to breed. I'll turn this down a little bit and talk over it. They'll come into the rivers to breed in the in the spring, and then um, uh, they'll actually end up dying after they breed. 
Uh, but they, just to show you a little bit of footage here, they construct nests much like a, a salmon or trout would. You can see them actually pulling rocks. Um, they suction cup onto rocks and drag them downstream. The reason I have the good kind uh, on the title of the slide here is because these sea lamprey that I'm filming here, uh, just outside of Fredericton, they're part of the, they're in their natural range. So in the Great Lakes, you may be familiar with sea lamprey in the Great Lakes uh, and they're an invasive species, but uh, in, on the East Coast, they're an, a native, um, a native fish species in the assemblages on the East Coast. So there's just more nest building there. I'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so what about inland lakes? Well, in, in inland lakes, we, we still have um, migratory fish species. Um, now, in the case of white sucker, they're actually, they're not technic, they're not anadromous. Okay, we'll just, they're not anadromous. They're what's called potomodromous. Um, but they still make similar kinds of migrations in that they will spend most of their time out in the, in the larger, you know, what it, one of the Great Lakes, uh, say Lake Michigan or, or Lake Huron. And then, um, then in the spring, they'll actually come into the tributaries, uh, much like a salmon would spend its time out in the ocean, Pacific salmon in the Pacific Ocean, and then come into coastal rivers to spawn. And so white sucker will do that as well. So that's the photo on the left here of a couple of white suckers that have come into a tributary. Um, and uh, where they'll spawn. Then they'll turn around and they'll go back out and in, back into the lake. Uh, this here, these are actually, uh, these are Chinook salmon, so uh, part of the Pacific salmon family. Um, these are actually in Coburg Creek, uh, a tributary of Lake Ontario. Um, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with Coburg, uh, you might know the YMCA in Coburg. This stream is right behind the YMCA. So next time you're down there, say end of September, early October, wander around the back of the YMCA and you may actually find, uh, find this uh, happening out there. Um, so lots of really big, you know, 10, 20, 30 pound salmon uh, in, uh, in pretty shallow water there. So they'd be doing the same thing, be coming in and they would be delivering these nutrients that they've gathered, uh, you know, way out in, in Lake Ontario, um, foraging on, on lots of oily fish species like alewife. And then they bring a lot of those, uh, those um, nutrients back into the river systems. And so at least with the case of white sucker, what's been shown is there's been a boost to ecosystem productivity associated with their migration. So um, uh, still a really important, uh, important migratory species within the Great Lakes. So what, you know, is, what are the threats or like what's happening with these species? Right? Well, unfortunately, uh, so Dr. Cook, who just introduced me, he was a co-author on a, on a recent publication uh, that, uh, that highlighted a, um, the fact that, that these types of species, these freshwater migratory fish populations are uh, really in peril. So there's about 76% decline worldwide and something like 93% of the, these group, uh, this group of fishes uh, in Europe alone. Okay, so they're really, really in peril. Um, a large part of that, uh, that decline uh, can be linked to um, uh, habitat connectivity. So installation of dams, culverts, uh, and, and other barriers that actually disrupt uh, the ability of a fish to move upstream into their necessary spawning grounds. So we see a couple examples here. There's a river herring in both photos actually um, congregated below a culvert. Uh, and then these herring here uh, that are congregated below a small dam, both on Prince Edward Island. And all told, this disruption to connectivity uh, uh, prevents the movement of, of these important nutrient sources into the freshwater ecosystems. Uh, but I didn't want to leave it there. I do want to mention that there is kind of some hope. Um, there's, you know, people actively trying to address this issue of habitat uh, disconnection and, and trying to restore connection into these rivers. Um, and, and freshwater ecosystems. One way we do that is through fishways. Uh, so the installation of fish passive structures, just what I spent a lot of my PhD uh, looking at. Um, and so we see here is a nature-like fishway. Um, so it tends to be a little more quote-unquote fish uh, friendly. Uh, and so you can see some river herring here that are passing through a notch within that fishway. Um, not all of them work as they should. And so we need to kind of be, you know, pretty routinely assessing their effectiveness. And, and lots of people are in fact doing that. Um, and th there's kind of a movement toward emphasizing multi-species fish passage. Typically, fishways have been constructed 
uh, to pass just a single species, usually trout um, or salmon. Um, and barrier removal, you know, we know lots of examples, including the example from the Elwha River in Washington, the Penobscot River in Maine, that when, we're in, when we remove a barrier, uh, we free up, uh, we reconnect those upstream habitats with the downstream habitats and fish respond very, very quickly. Uh, so here's a, here's a picture, here's a, uh, a GIF, a little video of the Condit, I believe that's the Condit Dam on the Elwha River. Um, that was uh, was decommissioned and removed. So there they are blasting it and you can see all the sediment uh, from the impoundment upstream now being released. And so in that river system, uh, a whole host of species uh, recolonized very, very quickly. So it's been a, a conservation success story there. Um, in, uh, in, in conclusion, um, I'd like to just reiterate that uh, anadromous fishes re provide really critical uh, ecosystem services via nutrient transfer, but unfortunately a, a number of their populations are, are highly imperiled um, and not just anadromous fishes, but you know other, other migratory species as well. Um, we have lots of documentation of these, these connections on the west coast, um, but we need more research uh, in other areas like the east coast and even in the Great Lakes, okay, with some of these potamodromous species that are just, of course, just migrating within the, well, the freshwater systems themselves. Um, and really to restore connectivity and to, to move more of these nutrients uh, into these ecosystems, we need more barrier removal. So it doesn't necessarily mean removing every single dam, um, but being really selective with which dams we remove, which, which culverts are needed, road crossings, can we put in something else there like a bridge instead of a culvert, um, things like that. So uh, there's, there's people that are actively working toward this, um, but we, we definitely have seen the benefits uh, and uh, and we need uh, we definitely need more barrier removal. Uh, so with that, I'm sure I probably talked uh, quite a bit. Um, I will uh, would be happy to field any questions. And if you'd like to send me an email after this presentation, uh, feel free to to go ahead and do that. And if you're interested in taking a look at some more fishy images, uh, feel free to visit my website too. Great. So let's start off with a round of applause for Sean. Unfortunately. I'm the only one that uh, that he can hear, but yes, we'll, uh, I'm sure everybody is everyone. clapping vigorously. So, so thank you for sharing. We really appreciate it. Uh, some incredible, uh, incredible photography, some Im uh, incredible imagery, and it's it's even better on a high definition, you know, screen not being being funneled through Zoom. So, um, let's start off with a, the first question from Beth, and she's asking: Are there migratory fish species in the Ottawa River? Yes, there are migratory sp fish species. So um, the American eel is probably the number one uh, most well-known migratory species. Now they're a catadromous species as opposed to the anadromous, uh, anadromous variety, which I spend, spent most of my time uh, talking about. But uh, yes, eels actually used to make up by biomass one of the, the most abundant fish species in the Ottawa River um, a long time ago, uh, pre uh, pre-hydropower dam development. And uh, unfortunately, their populations are extremely low right now, um, as a, largely as a consequence, a number of things, but one of the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest culprits to the population decline has been uh, hydropower. Um, so there have been some efforts to try and improve the situation there. There have been some really interesting partnerships between uh, industry and um, uh, and NGOs like the Canadian Wildlife Federation to create more fish friendly uh, turbines and 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 kind of retrofit uh, some existing facilities to try and make passage a little more uh, 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 at least facilitate passage and what we're really talking about for the most part is downstream passage so when they when the yields come in to the freshwater systems, they're usually small enough to be able to get around in, in various ways. I'm actually uh, not sh entirely sure, Steve might be able to answer this question, if they have uh, Elver, little juvenile passage devices around some of the dams, but in some cases they do. I know in the, on the East Coast uh, in Prince Edward Island, um, the uh, little actually have pictures of glass eels, which are beautiful. They're, picture a little piece of vermicelli, little tiny piece of pasta. 
and it's like translucent. That's what a little glass eel looks like. So before they get into that, you know, kind of maybe a little creepy looking snake-like form, they look like a little piece of translucent vermicelli. And as they get into the freshwater, they'll darken up, they'll grow a little bit bigger. Um, at some point though, they will often encounter like a barrier within a river system. They're small enough that they can actually um, adhere to using surface tension to the face of the dam. So if this is the face of the dam, they can actually swim along, they can kind of stick to the surface of the dam and just work their way up and over the dam. When they get too big though, they, gravity takes over and they lose that ability to, to do that. So they can get into freshwater okay, it seems, um, in, in a lot of cases, but coming back downstream is really, really difficult for those adults. And a lot of them end up uh, going through the turbines and it's, it's no bueno for, uh, for, those, for those fish that actually try and get through the turbines. Yeah, they, they often don't make it, but yes, so long, long answer to your question, but yes, we do have, we also have American shad uh, that not necessarily in the Ontario stretch, they seem to go up to the Carrion Dam uh, on the lower Ottawa, so kind of at the Quebec, Ontario border. Uh, there's a run of American shad that will go up to that dam there, but I don't really think they go much further than that. And then we have like Northern Pike are thought to be a Potomodromous migratory species that make discrete movements into uh, sort of flooded habitats along the shore. We have walleye as well. So, but definitely the American eel is like the, the most well-known. Lake sturgeon too. Uh, we have lake sturgeon as well and they're migrate, migratory species. So. Great, great answer. And I think what's what's interesting with fish, um, you know, if you if you read the textbooks too much, you're told that there's only a small percentage that migrate. And that sure, if you think of these sort of vast migrations, but you know, if you're a darter that's you know three inches long, and you need to move from you know your summer hangout to your winter overwintering grounds, and it's a hundred meters away, it's a pretty monumental migration yeah. for those animals too. So I think sometimes it's our scale. It gets us off when we think about these. yeah and that so that 2.5 percent may be much much bigger but yeah. uh we need uh yeah we might need to reevaluate that yeah. yeah cool all right uh next question from alex do catadromous species play a similar role in ecosystem services so uh um you know for example we had anadromous fish delivering marine derived nutrients to freshwater and 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 riparian areas what happens the other way around? How yeah, so when you've got, uh, that's actually an interesting question. Um, when, when you've got the catadromous species and the juveniles are coming into the freshwater systems, um, you know, yes, a number of them will end up dying, but a number of them will end up becoming food for other species, particularly those little vermicelli, uh, those little glass eels when they come into the systems in the spring. Um, and then the elvers, uh, they, they, will, uh, they will be consumed by other species within the river. I mean, you're talking thousands, millions of these little, these little elvers that are moving into, this, into the stream. This is just like, you know, uh, a, a, a really pronounced pulse of food for the fish at that time. So yes, in a way they, they, they form a, they, they, they have a similar function. It's probably just not as extensive as the anadromous species. Um, especially because you, you have to remember that a lot of those individuals will end up surviving to, uh, to adulthood. And so they, they aren't actually conferring those nutrients onto the environment uh, in the same ex to the same extent that anadromous species would. Good question. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to take, there's a couple questions in the chat as well that I'm going to draw upon. Uh, so from Jessica, how does being a scientist influence your behavior as a recreational angler and vice versa. How does being an angler influence you as a scientist? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always wary uh, of, uh, of treating the fish that I, I, I angle for with the utmost respect and try and, and use proper handling procedures. So I try and stay abreast of um, uh, the latest science and, and uh, and really try to try to promote proper handling of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I will share that information with other anglers as well. You know, I, I do, 
uh, recognize that, you know, I, I have a, a, in a place of privilege as someone that has, you know, had the opportunity to, to, um, you know, gain a lot of education. And I'd like to be able to share that with people. I see that as part of my duty as a, as a, as an angling scientist or a scientist angler, uh, if you will. So, um, you know, I try and give back to the local community to try and improve the, uh, the welfare of the fish that we, we are trying to, trying to capture. So it's a good question. Great, thanks. And the next question from Danny. And Danny wants to know why are there, you know, what, what's the purpose of the impoundments on PEI? Yeah. So what yeah. are they used for? Are they, are they hydropower, <laughs> yeah. drinking water? Why are there so many impoundments? Yeah, yeah. Um, mostly pond hockey, uh, recreational, you know, angling. Um, the actual, the real answer for that is largely uh, waterfowl habitat. So there is, you know, pond, plenty of pond hockey that's going on in the, in the winter uh, and uh, there's lots of trout ponds, but there's a lot of, uh, so Atlantic Canada is the, um, there's the Atlantic flyway for waterfowl. So actually my partnership during my PhD was with Ducks Unlimited Canada. Oddly enough, what do ducks and fish have to do with each other? I asked the same thing. Um, but uh, Ducks Unlimited is very forward thinking, pretty progressive, uh, especially out on the, on the East Coast. They appreciate uh, healthy ecosystems and um, they understand the need to move these kinds of fish into the habitats that the ducks that they care so much for are using in the spring for breeding and then for feeding uh, during, during the summer. And so they want to make, maintain um, uh, proper ecosystem functioning there. So the dams are in PEI are largely to create these impoundments that are waterfowl habitat. Yeah, but there's, you know, there's a lot of like historical uh, dams there that were part of, they were mill dams, um, wood, uh, uh, flour mill, uh, grist mills. Um, yeah, so there's, there's probably, at one point there were 800 impoundments on PEI, if you can believe that. Um, and a lot of them have fishways, but, but not all of them. And I, I think what's fascinating, when we think of dams, we always think of the mega structures, right? But, you know, if, if you're a, a fish as big as a rainbow smelt, what, six, eight inches for a yeah. big one, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, if it's a foot tall, it, it, it's a barrier. So. Yeah, and I should probably, uh, you know, since, since we just had the question about dams on PEI, they were all small, right? So I'm, I'm about six feet tall, and most of them were maybe half of my height. You know, they're only about three feet tall in a lot of cases. So these pretty, pretty small dams. Um, and so it's like a death, it's like death by a thousand cuts. So yeah, it's not a big structure. Um, it's still there. And they dot the landscape and they're all, you know, they're in every river system on PEI. And so, you know, as bad as, as or as disruptive, as, as disruptive as really big dams are, in my opinion, the, the little small dams that go unaccounted for all over the world are highly, highly problematic for, for, spe for migratory species, yeah. Great, okay, so the next question, you mentioned that the West Coast streams respond really well to subsidies because they're largely oligotrophic, so nutrient poor. Um, do you think that the more eutrophic streams, so nutrient rich streams in PEI and Ontario and elsewhere in the East, uh, do you think that, be, and that's largely because of, of land use, but other, other reasons as well, do you think that might mitigate the potential benefits of subsidies in, in, in these areas? I, I smile because we had many, many discussions. Uh, I had many discussions with lots of people on the East Coast about this. Um, in fact, I think I may have gotten a, a, that same question in my PhD defense. Um, and yeah, the, you know, the, an the, answer, the answer is you can't ignore that. That is a fundamental difference between West Coast systems and, and, e and East Coast systems. There are some exceptions, of course, there are some oligotrophic uh, streams in, in Cape Breton and then, you know, Labrador and, and areas in Newfoundland and things like that. Um, but yes, for the most part, a lot of the systems on the East Coast are more eutrophic. And, and the short answer is probably yes. There is, there's probably um, um, 
it probably reduces the influence, you know, with all of the nutrients running off the land, off of the land into the uh, into the ecosystems. Um, but you know, you're, you're going to not really get those omega threes running off of your uh, off of your farm fields into uh, into the into the rivers, right? So whereas the smelt eggs are chocked full of omega threes, so there's there's important uh, an important transfer of nutrients in that sense that you wouldn't be getting from land use effects. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the, the East Coast is really also interesting. I remember reading a, a, a paper um, that basically said, uh, we actually need to be, we need to be letting in less alewives, river herring, because all of the nutrients that they bring in to our already eutrophic systems create those harmful algae, they create the conditions or promote the conditions that lead to harmful algal blooms. So this particular paper was saying, okay, what we need to be doing is we need to kind of be counting, we need to be recording how many, until you get to a threshold and then you cut it off and you basically block the migration at that point. So that is like totally counterintuitive to what, you know, you would be doing on the West Coast, which is, uh, and in most other situations, which is let them all in, let as many in as you can. But the East Coast has, yes, inherent land use uh, changes and land use effects that, uh, that, that may, um, you know, may impact the, uh, uh, the, the benefit of those, in some cases, even create harmful situations for marine derived nutrients. Great, and I think we're gonna go with one last question here, this one from Graham. And so acknowledging that you've done lots of work on muskie and they're, they're certainly fun to catch. There's a lot of people that really like to catch walleye and bass. Mm -hmm. And you know, a, a big muskie will certainly cow down on those. So what do we know about anglers selectively removing muskie and other top predators like pike so that the walleye and bass can do better? Have you, have you heard of that happening? And do you think that's a, a good strategy? Uh, I don't think that's a good strategy in part because the number, the science is just not there to show, to, to indicate that muskies consume walleye and largemouth on a scale that would affect their populations. Yes, they eat them. They're an opportunistic predator. Uh, they're an apex predator that is not going to pass by, you know, uh, pass up a, a chance to, to chow down on a big Big Mac. Right, so they're going to consume when they feel the need to, but they are typically going after the 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 largest or the by abundance the highest the highest most abundant uh, fish species in the system, which typically in a lot of places would be like yellow perch or uh, or white sucker. So they will yes they will eat the. Um, they will eat largemouth bass and walleye. I don't know of anybody that's ever tried to selectively remove muskies in an effort to increase like size classes of, um, uh, of walleye and largemouth bass, in part because the regulations right now in public water bodies anyway are really high. So the Ottawa River is 54 inches. Um, it's pretty rare to catch a, a 54 inch muskie on the Ottawa River. Um, and there's a lot of other water bodies where they're 36 inches, 44 inches, and they don't grow much bigger in those, some of those water bodies. So uh, I've never heard of that done. I mean, if you had a, if you had an experimental, if you had an experimental lake um, where you might be able to do that, it would be interesting to see if that might happen. Now, part of me thinks that the periodic thinning of some individuals within uh, within the walleye and largemouth bass populations by muskies might actually decrease competition and, uh, uh, and increase opportunities for, for, uh, for fish to consume more and more resources so that you might actually get bigger fish with muskies present. I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't know too many studies that really assess that, but uh, it's an interesting question. I think I know who asked that. Can't hear you, Steve. So if you know Graham, you can follow up with him on that. And he's, yeah. he's got some clarifications here, but I think we'll, we're getting a, a bit far away from the, the theme. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap things up. We're about out of time. So first of all, I'd like to again thank Sean. Uh, so again, Dr. Sean Landsman from Carleton, thank you so much. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of, all of you. Uh, the, you know, this, this isn't 
Science for Scientists. Uh, this is science for the community. And so we're really thankful that you're interested in enough to take time out of your day to engage with us. So thank you very much on behalf of the, the Dean of Science at Carleton. And then finally, I'd like to remind you that there's another science cafe just around the corner. November 25th, uh, if you're interested in learning about how antidepressants anti work, uh, one of the professors from the neuroscience department will be speaking and able to answer any questions you have in that space. So with that, again, I'd like to thank all of you for your, your time and wish everybody a fantastic and a, a warm, warmer afternoon. Take care, folks. Thank you.